So, uh, broadly, so I'll speak today on this topic of our inner friend, that there is some, uh, our best, f something which is favorable for us is inside us, and something which is unfavorable to us also inside us. A friend and enemy is inside us. So, broadly, there are two kinds of people. Some people are wise, and some are otherwise. So, now, and it is not that there are two kinds of people, sometimes the same person acts in a very wise way and sometimes acts in a way that is otherwise. So, what exactly is going on? We all, when we uh, live in the world, when we function in the world, at that time, sometimes we shock ourselves. Why did I say that? How did I speak like that? Why did I do that? Have any of you had this experience? You know, you shock yourself sometimes, isn't it? And conversely, sometimes we surprise ourselves. We do something, or we speak something, we, we find, hey, how do I do this so well? So, there seems to be something going on inside us, which we don't really fully understand. And this is especially seen if we try to do something creative in our lives. There was a <coughs> British poet, uh, Taylor, he, he wrote a poem and he said that, you know, he, he used to write very complex poetry. And he, one of his poems, uh, I think it was Saturday Light, won a prize. So, the award winning committee, they wanted him to explain his poem. And this one particular passage was very abstruse. And then, yeah, can you explain what this means? And he read it once and he read it second time and he read it third time. And then he said, when I wrote this, God and I knew what it meant. Now, only God knows what it means. <laughs> so, <laughs> what happens essentially is that, when we try to do something creative, and especially if we have some ability with that, then it seems that sometimes we are able to do something which, is, which surprises even us. Sometimes we get ideas. So, there is a lot going inside us which we don't know so well. So, here I will offer some model, okay, we are three, right? thank you, that is quite well done. So, these, these three figures which you see, I am going to talk based on an acronym ACE, how to ACE our, in our inner life, A-C-E. So, acknowledge, analyze is here, confront is there and empower is here. So, let us start with analyze here. So, we all need some working model to understand our inner world. Like I said, something, uh, sometimes we surprise ourselves, sometimes we shock ourselves. So, what is going on inside us? So, the ancient yoga texts of India offer us a binary model, which explains that we at our core are spiritual beings. Inside us, there is a, there is a, you could say a, good side and a bad side. And this can be called by different names. Right, Let us look at two names, which two words which I used to describe this. There is a mind and there is the intelligence. Now, the word mind can have many different meanings. But here broadly speaking, the mind refers to the impulsive side within us. The side which makes us jump to conclusions, rush into knee jerk reactions and often gets us into trouble. Whereas the intelligence is both the rational side as well as the inspirational side, where something deeper insights come from within us. So, if you see this first figure over here, the one on the right. So, we are here and we are facing the outer world. So, when we face the outer world, sometimes unknown to us and unexpected to us, the good part within us comes up and we surprise ourselves. And sometimes the dark side within us comes up. And we shock ourselves, how could I do like that? So, one of the psychologists have many different theories about what goes on inside our psyche. But one thing they are more or less unanimous about is that we are not the masters of our own house. That there is a lot going on inside us that we do not understand. And we need some conceptual model to understand this. So, normally say we are facing the world outside and we are trying to deal with it. But we need to understand which side of us is present at that time. Otherwise, we start functioning 
and we all have moods sometimes we feel inspired to do something and sometimes we just feel like doing nothing some people they just don't do anything at all and they ask them he said i am in power saving mode <laughs> now power saving mode is good for a device but power saving mode is for a purpose you save power so that you can have the power we can talk with somebody or receive some messages conserve it for a purpose conserve the power for a purpose but some people are in perpetual power saving mode they just don't do anything at all now that is not very healthy so essentially uh, there is when we are facing the outer world which what is going on inside us matters a lot in fact it matters much more than what is going on in the outer world so our own mood our own attitude our own disposition uh, and not just our own mood attitude disposition but it's overall which side of us is is appearing on the scene at that time that matters and sometimes if uh, say in a sports team a sports match some team is expected to perform very well and then that team performs poorly so sometimes the, the sports commentators may say actually this team didn't come to the field only today it's some somebody else came over there some impersonator came over there is it like that so that happens with all of us so we first of when we look at this sometimes what happens we just go along with whatever happens and we if we are able to do something very good we become very proud yes see how great i am and i was just in stanford i gave a talk over there uh about a month and a half ago so after that a professor over there was talking with me and the professor was telling that they did a st st study of students in the ivy league and they said that broadly the students go through two states of mind one is grandiosity and the other is inferiority whenever i, I am meeting someone who whom i am better than i feel i am so good and whenever i meet someone who is who is better than me then i feel inferior i feel inadequate so these two emotions we just keep going through so basically sometimes the higher so we are all facing the world outside and in the world sometimes we'll have positivity sometimes we'll have negativity and that affects us but more than that what is going on inside us that affects us much more so we could uh, give an example for understanding that there are these two sides it's like say suppose we are typing on a computer and now there is a keyboard editor and at keyboard editor whatever we type it is meant to it will accumulate it so that its proper note is available but suppose we type it and suppose there is a virus and whatever we type it starts getting distorted so you are typing one thing and what is appearing on the screen is something different then th that computer that device is not assisting us in doing what we want to do it is obstructing us something similar happens to us if we don't understand the dynamic of our inner world so the first point is analyze look at yourself and see actually there are these two forces there's some dark force within us and there's some 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 there's a negative force within us and there's a positive force within us and the yoga traditions of india give this two names we could call it the mind and the intelligence and the mind is linked to the inner darkness within us the intelligence is linked to the inner light within us and based on which comes to the fore that's how we face the outer world so this is the first point any comments or questions about this model till now okay let's move on you can see that figure third confront so now what happens so here, here you see we are facing the outer world we don't know what is inside and then suddenly we surprise ourselves or shock ourselves but confront means we understand that there is two forces within me there is the intelligence and the mind and with awareness of that we face the outer world so when we tend to become distracted so what is happening when we are getting distracted our mind is taking control and our mind is thinking of this thinking of that thinking of that thinking of that and we get our our attention gets dissipated by that and if we are not aware that there is a distracting mind within us then we get distracted but don't even realize what is happening but if we confront i understand there is a distracting force within me and there is also a part of me which wants to focus which wants to uh, which wants to be productive which wants to be effective so we need to look at our own lives and we all have this dark side within us which 
if it is uh, uncontrolled, confront means that we understand that all of us have certain weaknesses. We may be lazy, we may be short tempered, we may be insensitive, we may be irresponsible. Now that's not how we always are, but we all have certain weaknesses. So that means there is this side inside us which is uh, which is working against us. And if we understand it properly, then we are aware that this can happen. We confront that possibility. So in one sense, for all of us, at every moment, there are trajectories. So right now you are sitting, you can choose to hear and try to understand what is going on. But inside your mind, some different thoughts might come up. And you might get caught in those thoughts and you might go in that direction also. So confront means that each of us has to choose. If I follow the mind, where will I end up? How, you know, it is, it is sometimes important to recognize uh, how dark we might become if we don't rein in our dark side. One of my friends is a cancer specialist. I just was talking with him in Phoenix. And he was telling me that Generally, for most cancers, the treatments are not pleasant. It's, the treatments often have side effects. And of course, if some better treatment would be there, uh, we would naturally adopt that. But chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they all have, have their own side effects. And one of the things that is required for the patient to take the treatment is to stop living in denial. First, I don't have this disease only. And then they say, okay, maybe I have it, maybe it's not that serious. So, yes, nobody wants to take a difficult treatment. But unless the patient confronts the reality that this can, this can kill me, this can debilitate me completely, how, far, how bad this disease can be, when, this, when the patient accepts that prognosis, then after that the patient becomes ready to take the treatment. Till that point, till the patient doesn't confront the reality and the gravity of the disease, the patient doesn't take the treatment. So similarly for all of us, we need to confront ourselves. Sometimes we might just yell, we might just yell at someone, sometimes we just uh, out of laziness not do something. And these might be small things and sometimes they may have not much consequences. But if we keep giving in to our weaknesses, now where we will end up, confronting that is very important. We all might get into some unhealthy habits. Say it is said about alcoholism, what happens is first the drinker takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the drinker. So it becomes a cumulative effect where it just, just goes very fast. Initially, it seems to be very slow, but eventually it goes very fast. Uh, do we have snowfall over here? I think obviously it is, it's Canada. Actually, I've been in America for one and a half months, and before that I was in other parts of the world. So we have snowfall. And do you have any hill over here where we see snowballs being formed? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay. So now, I was in Calgary last year, and I was, one of my talks was on top of a hill. So it was snowing at that time. So we actually saw how the snowballs are formed. So initially at the top, it's not even a snowball. It's a snow pebble, just a tiny thing. And as a snow pebble is formed, somebody could just flip it with their toe and crack it. And that will be the end of it. But as the snow pebble starts growing, 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 two things happen. It gains mass and it gains momentum. And as it gains mass and momentum, it starts moving down faster and faster and faster till it becomes a snowball. And then after that, it's not just a snowball, it still keeps going further, it can become a snow boulder. And by the time it becomes a snow boulder, you know, it can completely knock over the person. The same person who could just uh, flip it with their toe, now can get bowled over by it. So what is, that is the, the snowball, snow pebble, when it's unstopped, it is not stopped, it can become a snow boulder and it can, as you say, overwhelm us. That's why we say sometimes this problem has snowballed. A snowball is also a verb, it has grown too much. So for us, our dark tendencies are like that. 
Right now, they might be like snow pebbles. But we need to confront them. But if I keep giving in to this, if I keep giving in to this, if I keep giving to this, what will happen is, I may end up ruining my life. I might do something which can just completely uh, devastate me. I was at MIT a couple of years ago, Massachusetts, and there I heard a story of an Indian boy. Now Indians, uh, and they're generally quite industrious in terms of studies. Right now in Harvard, a court case is going on. There's an in Indian parent. They basically, har they, they have this whole policy of, of diversity and inclusion. So they favor students who are not represented in, their com in the university. So what happens is the students who are from particular backgrounds, even if they don't have a high CGPA, they are, they are given entry and students maybe from Indian and Chinese background, even if they have a high CGPA, don't come inside. So there's a court case going on that there's discriminate against. This is discrimination. So anyway, this was a brilliant student from India. He had come from IIT, which is the top college in India. From there he came up. And then when he came here, he uh, he just gone for a party. And in that party, he, he just drank. And then somehow he, <coughs> he started driving after that. There's nobody else to drive. Somebody else could enter. But he was, oh, I'm in a new country. And this is such a special place. Let me enjoy. And he was, he was a little drunk. And somehow while driving, he, there he was going through a school area. It was, and he hit a child. And it is one thing serious to hit a child. It's much more serious to, it's another thing serious to drive under in intoxication. To have both of them together, oh, he just, He's completely disgraced, and there was such severe law code, law, I mean, legal implications that his whole career was practically ruined. And then he went back to India in disgrace. And he never thought that when he was just uh, drinking and driving, that such a small thing would lead to such a big thing. So, you know, we might at present, given to our weaknesses, nothing may happen. But when they can snowball, we don't know. It's like, uh, <clears throat> I'll come to this metaphor later. Say, if we are in an ocean, and that ocean is known to have stormy waves. Sometimes it might be ocean, and there's no stormy waves, so nothing happens. But we might go there like 10 days there, and nothing happens. And the 11th day, a stormy wave comes, and we get completely swept away. So this confronting that this particular weakness that I have, if I don't pay attention to it, if I don't take it seriously, deal with it seriously, it can ruin me. And even if it doesn't ruin me, so there is destruction and there is distraction. <coughs> now, distraction is a problem, but it is like a, it is a snowball that goes on throughout our life. It's, it's snowball never snowballs literally. But on an average, statistics have found that, studies have found that people spend between, especially youth, spend about two to four hours uh, on unproductive time. Just surfing, social media, doing this, doing that. And if you consider it, if you just calculate that, even if you can take a conservative estimate, not even two hours, uh, two hours or one hour also, if you monetize it as they grow up, it's, it's a colossal amount. Nobody would squander that much money if somebody got a thousand dollars, they won't just let it get lost. But we let our time go away like that, and eventually the time which could be monetized is lost. So we need to confront what can happen if we let this inner dark take control of us. Uh, now this can seem very optimistic. But as I said that, it's not optimistic because, it, sorry, it, this can seem very pessimistic. But it's not pessimistic because like if you understand that there's a disease and if you understand that it can be cured, then understanding the gravity of the disease brings intensity to the treatment. Brings intensity in our adopting the treatment. So similarly, all of us have some strengths within us. All of us have some positivity within us. All of us have some talents, some gifts, some inspiration. So what good can we do with it? If we, if we were the best that we could be, then what is, the, what is the light that we can bring to the world? What is the contribution that we can make, make to the world? What is the achievement that we can have? We need to confront that. So confront doesn't mean necessarily negative, confront also the positive. So here it's more in terms of envision. 
that you know this is all that ability that I have. It's all the potential that I have, and it will all get wasted if I don't use it properly. So, uh, when we confront, then we realize the consequentiality of our actions. That each, uh, every small choice that we do, it matters. Some choices matter a lot. Some choices <coughs> matter less. But every choice matters. And what happens? The choices also, the more we choose something, it starts snowballing. It starts becoming like an automatic or a default choice. Suppose you have a phone. And of course, not suppose, all of you have a phone. <laughs> but suppose you're on your phone, in your browser, say you were visiting certain sites. Suppose somebody visits sports.com. Repeatedly, they visit sports.com. And now they come for a spiritual talk. They are OK. It seems to be interesting. Let me find out what is the spirituality. So they decide to visit spirituality.com. And they start typing in their browser, SP. What happens? Sports appears. Yeah, sports appears. Why is that? Because it's a habit. Because it's a habit, yeah. It's our habit. And that our browser has picked up that habit. Because it has picked up that habit, so it's just giving that as an autocomplete. So similarly for us, each choice that we make, each choice is not just a choice in isolation. Each choice is a commitment to similar choices. Sometimes it's a conscious commitment, sometimes it's an unconscious commitment. But it is a commitment to future choices. And then each time we make a particular choice, the future, cho future choice becomes easier. So if we are lazy once, twice, thrice, four times, then being lazy becomes the habit. So then if I just type SP, then what if sports has already come, then I actually have to delete sports and then I have to type or I have to type spirituality fully. So similarly, if a particular habit has been formed, we can always change our habits, but it requires much more effort if something has already been formed. So even if our dark side tries, doesn't lead us to necessarily to distress or disaster, but still at the very least, it will dissipate our energy. In our own inner conflicts, in our inner own, own inner mess, we get lose so much of our energy that we have very little ener the energy available for us to do something externally becomes less. Sometimes you turn on your phone in the morning and it's fully charged. And after two, three hours you say just nine percent charge. So hey, what happened? I barely used the phone. So what happened was that actually there are some apps which just suck power. And they are going on in the background, and we are not even aware of those apps. But they are there, they are sucking our power. So like that, our dark side can suck our energy. Sometimes, you know, some people wake up in the morning, and within two, three hours, they feel, you know, I am longing for the next nap now. I am longing for the next nap. The first time, sometimes, we just, we just get, feel so tired, burdened, because our thoughts, the dark side within us depleting our energy. One relatively noxious way in which the dark side can deplete our energy is through indecision. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do that? Should I do that? Some people say, I was confused earlier. Now, I'm not so sure. <laughs> now, what has happened? They just, we just get caught in our head and lost. So, understanding that there is this inner it can, if it's not an inner destroyer, then it's an inner dissipator of energy. So we confront that. And that brings us to the last part. Last part is empower. So any questions about us till now? About the confront part? Yeah? So you said that if we give in to the, uh, to the mind part, hmm. then the consequences will snowball. Yeah. And do you think that if we follow the intelligence part, the consequences will snowball? Yes, well? that's true. That's definitely, that's the last part of the talking. Okay. Empower. <laughs> empower. So the good part of, any other questions? Okay. So the good part of, uh, about our inner nature is that it is malleable both ways. It is malleable in terms of being reshaped because of the inner dark within us. It is malleable in terms of being shaped by the inner light within us. So what is this, what do we mean by this inner light? The Gita explains that there, that we are all, the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient yoga text, and it explains that we are all potentially divine, because we are all parts of divine, the divine. 
there's a spark of divinity within us and the inner light within us ultimately is our connection with the supreme divine so whenever we are able to do something which surprises us how do i do that so well that time actually it is a spark of the divine that is manifesting through us we are becoming a channel for something bigger than ourselves and in fact if you see most scientific most inspirations in any field whether it is science or art or literature it's almost as if the idea comes ready made let's mm. uh, some people are thinking about a particular thing thinking thinking you don't get anything but suddenly just get it it's almost like the solution comes fully formed and this is the experience of creative people in almost every field so where do they get that the source of inspiration is often a scientific mystery but the fact of inspiration is an undeniable reality it's it's there and it's, it's our brain normally works by linear logical functioning but linear logical functioning cannot go to such a quantum leap and arrive at understandings that sometimes people get uh, there was another pioneering uh, scientist in the field of electrical engineering and he was goss and he he got certain he formulated some equations in electrical engineering and they started being used by scientists all over the world but almost for 40 he 40 years after he, he postulated those equations and after that he died nobody had any proof for them so everybody people people were using it but there was no logical proof for it the logical step by step proof came almost several four to five decades after he postulated them so where did it come from nowadays we say that if somebody is brilliant you say you are a genius now if you look at uh, the history of literature say before the scientific revolution in the 16th 17th centuries the people would not say you are a genius people would say you have a genius so genius refers to some higher presence and that higher presence is manifesting through you and we see in any field of sport any field such as sports where performance oriented sometimes some players are in form and when they are in form they can they are in touch and they can play so brilliantly and when they are out of form no matter what they do they just don't seem to be able to do anything well and nowadays this such may use nowadays motivational speakers may use the word flow when you are in a flow things just happen now how do you get into that flow actually there might be certain things which we can do to get into a flow but the important thing is when the flow is there the flow is coming from something beyond us and we become a channel for that so that channel ultimately is the you are described as there is the divinity within us and that divinity is what we can become a channel for and to the extent we become a channel for the divinity to that extent the darkness within us gets sidelined so if you see this last figure now of empower so when we are we need to empower the bright side within us not the dark side within us so when the when the bright side is empowered then what happens the intelligence is in charge and the intelligence regulates the mind our emotions our impulses they are not necessarily always bad but they just need to be evaluated we can't give in to them so the intelligence controls the mind and then you see that the inner inner darkness gets sidelined and then the inner light empowers the intelligence the purpose of mindfulness of meditation of spirituality and of spiritual practices is ultimately to empower the inner light within us to basically what do we mean empower the inner light it is basically now if say we are here if the inner light is here and we are here so we could either be conductors we could be semiconductors or we could be insulators so when we are insulators then the higher presence within us cannot guide us cannot help us cannot empower us and then what happens when we are not connected this way then we get connected with inner darkness within us so the whole process of mindfulness and meditation is to shift our inner state from being a insulator to being a conductor and that is called as purification 
purification means as long as we have self-centered desires within us, then see when we take credit, oh I am so clever, I am so smart, I am so brilliant, to the extent we start taking credit, that, that pride, that self-centeredness starts becoming like a block. And to that extent, sometime we may just go on and because of sheer talent we might be able to do some things. But gradually we start becoming like insulators. But to the extent we become purified, purification essentially means that the self-centered desires within us start going down. And as those self-centered desires start going down, then we start becoming from insulators to conductors. And as we become conductors, then we will find that we will be able to do things better than what we thought we could. Our spirituality increases our ability to tap our ability. Many people may have abilities, but some, in every area we sometimes talk about wasted talents. Some people have talent, but they don't have the temperament to balance it. They are too moody, they are too uh, arrogant, uh, they, are, they don't have commitment and then they waste their talent. They are talent, but they don't work it properly. So, our spirit, whatever talent we have, we can increase it by gradual practice. That might not change dramatically. But our temperament can change dramatically. The more we grow spiritually, the more we empower ourselves, then what happens? Our ability to tap our ability is increased. Because complementing the talent is temperament. You, know, you could say there is an equation, talent plus temperament is equal to achievement. If you have only talent, there can be some sporadic achievement. If you have only temperament, there can also be some achievement, but it will be modest. But the talent and temperament, then the achievement can be dramatic. So that is what we want to pursue in our lives. So now how do we empower ourselves, how do we change ourselves from being insulators to conductors? That is where spirituality comes in. Now spirituality involves various practices. <coughs> we talk broadly about three practices A, B, C. With this I will conclude. A is association, B is books and C is chanting mantras. So association means that we, we become like the people we associate with. Our desires are not just linear, they are triangular. Uh, what do I mean by linear and triangular desires? That Linear desire means we see something and we desire it. We see some object, I want to buy. We see some food item, I want to eat it. If we see some attractive, say, new phone, I want to buy it. That's linear desire. But for many of the important things in life, our desires are not linear. Say, have any of you heard of? Have any of you heard of baklava? Baklava? Yeah, it's an Arabian dish. Mm, it's an Arabian desert. So when I had long ago, maybe five, six years ago, I had gone to Australia for the first time. So when I had gone there, uh, I had gone to one friend's house and he was, he said, for dessert we have baklava, would you like to have it? Now, I had never heard of baklava and the name baklava also does not sound very pleasant. <laughs> baklava, okay. <laughs> so I said, maybe later. And then another friend was there with me, he says, give me. And then he took it and then he was eating it. I was savoring it. Every bite, you, every morsel was yum, yum, savoring it. And I looked at him, I said, okay, give me one also. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? Just hearing about the baklava or seeing the baklava did not create a desire. The desire was not linear. But seeing somebody enjoying the baklava created the desire. That is triangular desire. So uh, if you see, Many times when big corp corporate uh, companies, when they make a product, they don't just, uh, they don't just uh, advertise the product, they have some celebrities who endorse the product. Now what is, why is that? Because so many great products can be there, oh, but the celebrity is endorsing it. So the desire is not just linear, it is triangular. So similarly for us, the world we live in today, our dark, much of our association around us will, act, will knowingly or unknowingly empower the dark side within us. The culture is such that there is so much self-centeredness. 
the people nowadays are eye specialists, not eye specialists, eye specialists. You know, so everybody is so self-centered, and uh, you know, if we consider addictions, they are so common. And how do addictions start? It's usually by association. We associate somebody who is says, abusing drugs or doing some, some substance abuse of some kind, and then gradually it grows. So, so especially for if something is visually also we can see something something looks attractive, then the linear desire might come. But when something doesn't look that attractive, and spirituality can sometimes look attractive. Now you see sit some see somebody sitting in a yogic meditation posture, he looks very peaceful. But real life doesn't seem to be like that. There is so much turbulence in our real life. So we may not be able to sustain that desire just linearly. That's why triangular. I mean, we need to associate with people who are spiritually minded. Associate with those who are analyzing their inner world, who are confronting their inner darkness, and who are empowering their inner light. So that is what it, uh, spirituality is. It begins with association. It's sustained by association. So the kind of people we choose to associate with, that's the kind that's the side of us which will empower. And actually in today's world, we don't need to do anything to empower the dark side. By default, you could say the dark side will get empowered. Because the media, the culture around us will, will systematically trigger the violent, the abusive, the addictive desires which are there within, within us. So we need to conscientiously associate with those who will, um, who will illumine, our, who will activate our, our bright side. Association. B is, does anyone remember what is B? I mentioned that. A, B, C, I am talking about. B is? Books. Books, yeah. Thank you. So, books means there is so much information available in the world today, and we can just get swamped by information. If there is information overload, there can be information chaos. chaos. But we need to understand about ourselves. So, wisdom texts which talk about our inner world, which help us to understand who we are they are very important to read. So, such reading of wisdom texts can empower our intelligence. So, when we are, when, our, when our intelligence is empowered, then we understand the nature of the reality. Otherwise, sometimes we get ambushed from within. We think that I am going to do this, but suddenly some other desire comes up, we don't know, why am I feeling like this? What is going to happen? Why am I, why is this happening? And we just, just get swept away by it. So, studying books, not just once in a while, but regularly, that helps us to uh, empower our higher side. And C is chanting of mantras. The sound has great power. And mantras are specific sound vibrations which, uh, which have packed concentrated spiritual power within them. So these mantra chants can redirect our consciousness very quickly. So when our consciousness is say get getting triggered by the, pushed by the dark side in a particular direction. Then the chanting of mantras can give a redirection for it. So, in our tradition we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. What this, what such mantra chanting is meant to do is, provide us an inner anchor. And we all have to find out what can act as an inner anchor for us. If you forget everything else from this talk, just can remember this one point. It's about the, we all have to find and develop our inner anchor. What, say, what is an anchor? So imagine if we are in a, as earlier said, if we are in a in an ocean, and the sea is calm, even if the waves come, it doesn't matter, because the waves are also relatively calm waves, small waves. But if a storm comes, huge waves are coming. At that time to hold on, to fight against the waves is impossible. When the waves are coming, just get swept away. But if we have an, some firm object, maybe a boat or maybe the anchor of the boat, something which is firm, which is heavy, which is strong, if there is an anchor that we can hold on to, that also is difficult. Because when the waves hit, the force might be such that holding on to the anchor may also become strenuous. But relatively speaking, the chances of holding on to the anchor with our finite energy are far greater than 
the chances of fighting against the waves. The waves are coming at fire. Myself tried to fight against the waves. I just swept away. What can we do? But if we hold on to the anchor, then we can steady ourselves. And we all need to find out what is the anchor that works for us. That means we have to find out something important in our life which uh, redirects our consciousness positively. So mantras can act as an anchor. If we habituate ourselves to chanting mantras, then as soon as we start chanting the mantra and try to focus on the chanting of the mantra, our thoughts go in that direction. As our thoughts start going in that direction, then we become anchored. So it can work, same can work through spiritual music. Now when the dark desires within us start rising, I say, no, I don't want to think like this. I don't want to do like this. If you fight against that is like fighting against views. It's very difficult. But if you start hearing some spiritual music, or if we have some spiritual wisdom quotes, you read them and repeat them, contemplate them, hold on to them intellectually. Then we hold on to the anchor. Then although the inner darkness within us might be strong, the inner waves, dark waves might start coming, but we will hold on. And if we hold on, like any storm, that storm will come and the storm will go. So no storm lasts forever. And similarly, the dark desire that rises within us also don't last forever. But if we understand that I can't fight against them myself, I need an anchor. The ultimate anchor, the yoga text explain, is the supreme divinity. The whole process of medit purpose of meditation is not just to calm ourselves. It is important to calm ourselves, but it's ultimately to con not just to calm ourselves, but to connect ourselves. Connect ourselves with the whole. We are all parts of a cosmic whole. And the more we connect ourselves with the whole, the more we gain stability. So the supreme divinity is the ultimate anchor. That is the ultimate reality. And to the extent we by our spiritual growth, learn to connect with that divinity within us. To that extent, whenever the dark forces rises, rise within us, we will be able to resist their influence. And uh, during positive times, we will become channels for the light within us to come out, to stream out, and to illumine the world, illumine our own lives, and illumine the lives of those around us. And we all, if we think about it, we all can Whatever situation we are in, we can either make things worse or we can make things better. So we all discovering how much good we can do. We all know that if we just glide along, we all can do we all might do things terribly. Sometimes we feel that I'm in such a terrible situation. I'm just helpless. And I'm hemmed in this way, I'm hemmed in that way, I'm hemmed in this way. I can't do anything. Have any of you been in such a situation when you feel you are helpless? Any time? Yes, now when you feel you are helpless, actually we are not helpless. Because no matter how powerless we are, we still have the power to make things worse. <laughs> now you may say, now somebody might have an injury and they may be fractured and they might be on maybe bedridden. Say, I am helpless. But even when you are helpless, you can take a hammer and your one knee is broken, you can break the other knee also. He says, what stupidity, who will want to do that? Now, obviously, no, no one should do that. But my point is that we are never as powerless as our mind would have us believe. This is a counterintuitive thought, counter thought exercise to understand that no matter, how, if, no matter how bad things are, if I can make them worse, then that means I can make them better also. So we are never as powerless as we think. And discovering how much good we can do if we become a conductor for the divine within us. They're making, they're discovering how much good we can do is, that is what makes life into an adventure. And just letting the dark within us act will make our life into a misadventure. And how bad the misadventure can be or how good the adventure can be, that is the choice we all can make. And by, by spiritual practices, by spiritual wisdom, we can empower ourselves to make our life into an adventure, wherein we deal with the difficulties from outside, we deal with the difficulties from inside by connecting with a power bigger than ourselves. And we bring light into our own world and into the world around us. So I'll summarize.
what I spoke today. I spoke on this topic of our best friend is within us and our enemy is also within us. We talked about the acronym ACE, how to ACE our inner world. Three points were, what were the three points? Analyze, confront, empower. Yeah, it is there. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> but just so analyze means sometimes we we shock ourselves with the way we speak or the way we act. What's going on? I didn't think I was so bad. What am I doing? It's not that we are so bad, but that kind of bad forces are there within us. And sometimes we surprise ourselves. How, where did, how did I speak that? How do I draw that? How do I do that? Where did the idea come from? So actually, there is there are there are four. Our inner world is like a battleground for forces bigger than us, both the forces of light and the forces of darkness. So to understand the inner world, there is a model given by the yoga texts. That is, uh, there is a dark side within us which can be called as the mind. That the bright side within us is the intelligence, and the intelligence is connected with the ultimate bright side that is divinity within us, and uh, mind is connected with the. <coughs> mind is the reservoir of the dark impressions within us which can accumulate so we need we if we just uh, face the world unaware of the complexity of our inner world then we we will be ambushed because we expect our best side to appear and the worst side appears at that time we don't know what to do but if we confront that means we understand that the dark side within us it's like a snowball Right now it might be a snow pebble, but it can become a snowball and a snow boulder and can ruin me. So think, con contemplating how our weaknesses, if unattended, can wreck our lives, can bring some sobriety, some gravity. Like a patient has to understand the gravity of a cancer so that they can take up the treatment, even if it is a little difficult. So then we also confront in terms of what all abilities we have and what contribution we can make through the abilities. So our, and that's where we talk about empower. Empower means our spirituality can increase our ability to tap our ability. So we need empowerment in the sense that our dark side it needs to be sidelined, and our bright side it needs to be it needs to be brought into the center stage. So for doing this, we talked about A B C. What was A? Association. Association. I talked about how our desires are not just linear but also triangular so if you associate with those who are trying to develop their bright side our bright side will also develop but if we but by default in today's culture and today's media largely people who are giving into their dark side uh, that's the kind of people we see around us so we need to be cautious b was books books yeah so reading wisdom texts helps us understand the complexity and the dynamics of our world and ensures that we don't get ambushed that we learn to understand ourselves and empower our higher side. And C was Chant. chanting, chanting of mantras. So there, I talked about how the mantras can redirect our consciousness. They are spiritual. They are spiritual power, packed, concentrated in sound. And by the utterance of mantras, we can reorient our consciousness in a positive direction. So then I conclude by talking about anchors. That the waves of the dark side within us will hit us. We can't fight them on our own, but if we connect with and we discover our anchor and learn to hold on to that anchor, then our capacity to resist will increase manifold. And when we feel helpless that there are so many things wrong in our life, we are not, no matter how bad things are, we can always make them worse. So we are not as powerless as we think. And if you are not as powerless, that means we can make them better also. So. If we give in to our dark side, our life will be a series of misadventures. But when we learn to become a conductor, not an insulator, for the divinity within us, then discovering how good can, how much good we can do, that can make our life into an adventure. Thank you very much. Any, any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Bring us back to, uh, yeah, right. So everyone has their own anchor, uh, right? Like someone, we have 
something we always resort back to. Yeah. So something positive, but sometimes we may think that something good uh, is bad and vice versa. But something that's uh, bad for us for taking shelter of that as our anger. Can you give an example of what you mean? What is, how do we know that anchor is good for us? Broadly speaking, it's through the consequence. What is the effect of it? Sometimes, some things can make us feel good, but they temporarily make us feel good. But in long term, they don't help. So we could have, suppose somebody is sick and they take a painkiller. The immediate effect is good, feel relief, the pain just goes away. But, uh, but inside the disease is worsening and the pain will come back worse after some time. So, in one sense, entertainment can also be an anchor for people. I feel troubled, let me just watch some movie, let me just play some game, video games or whatever. Now that might provide some relief, but for how long? It's like a painkiller. Now in some cases, painkillers might be needed if the pain is very much. But there's a curative medicine, so we have to look at in terms of long-term consequence. Now when there's an over-dependence on painkillers, now almost everybody when they have surgery, uh, like especially a thigh surgery or something like that, then they, as a part of the pain killing medicine, some steroids are given quite often. But it is not that everybody who takes steroids at that time becomes uh, addicted. Why? Because if their whole life is in balance, they take it for that time and then they move on to normal life. But it is when their whole life is out of balance, and then that becomes the compulsive thing that they learn, run towards to gain relief from life's challenges. That's when they get into trouble. So I'll say that we have to look at the long-term consequences of what we are doing. Is it helping us grow or it is, is it just helping us hide from the challenges of life? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, from this talk, uh, we can understand that uh, from your analysis, we can understand that there is some bad part, some good part, and uh, if we are not, uh, uh, if we are not careful, we always succumb into bad part. Yeah. Now, uh, my question is, should we all, uh, should we think about that uh, always becoming good, or otherwise, wh why I should not worry about why I am put in this situation of always being bad or good? Okay. Should I worry about this situation or should I worry about uh, becoming good only all the time? Uh, so should we worry about why we are put in a particular situation or should we just worry about being good? No, one part of trying to choose wisely is also choosing our situations as much as possible. Right, like I can take an extreme example. If somebody uh, wants to be, somebody is an alcoholic and they are trying to recover from alcoholism. And if their house is right next to a bar, now no matter how much resolution they make, it is just very difficult to sustain that because the path for indulgence is so easily accessible. So, to some extent, we need to analyze, you know, should I stay here? If I am serious about recovering, maybe I should not stay here. So, we need to change the situation. I gave a talk at Google recently. So, in in Silicon Valley, so I was telling, uh, it's interesting. Google is such a big institute, uh, institution that even the Google employees didn't know about the experiment that happened there itself. That apparently they had found that a uh, lot of employees in Google uh, were having health issues, you know, diabetes, and many of them obesity related. So, they they consulted some health spe health health specialists, and they suggested that. In your cafeteria, all the sweets, all the desserts, the chocolates, everything that is there, just cover it with non-transparent paper. Not paper that tells and advertises what is inside and not just transparent gla uh, glass or plastic, cover it. And they found that they did it for six months and just by that, about 33 percent of consumption of desserts went down. And from their perspective, 
uh, that means they have to pay less in health insurance and it is so the point is that uh, for us if there is a, if i am here and the particular indulgence is here if there is no obstacle between me and that thing then i'll just gravitate towards that and you can say why don't i have the willpower to resist it willpower is a finite resource we don't have infinite willpower so if some temptation is here in front of us and we are here and we are resisting that temptation so each moment that we are resisting that temptation if we are not having some positive focus then that confront that contact with the temptation is gradually eroding our will power and eventually will succumb so uh, asking why we are in a particular situation and checking whether that situation can be changed that is always helpful now it may not always be possible and certainly we shouldn't blame the tempting situation we shouldn't justify our lapses as be as we can outsource the responsibility for our lapses to the tempting situations but it's helpful if we can consider why we are in a particular situation and whether we need to be in that situation at all uh, sometimes uh, the best way to deal with temptation is to not deal with temptation does it address your question so now what is it with respect to net surfing so much time if you are spending too much on net time on net surfing maybe just have some filter or something like that by which we don't have to continuously battle maybe i want to just check what happens is we are doing some studies and we get a notification your friend has updated their facebook profile photo and then you say oh what photo are they but let me look at it and you look at one photo and you say or oh, maybe let me look at one more and one more and what we thought would be maybe 30 seconds becomes 3 hours and then we beat ourselves why did i waste so much time so no it's not no social media is not bad but it has need to be regulated so maybe having some controls it's always helpful okay thank you any other questions or comments maybe some of you can just speak briefly uh, something which you will be like a carry home point for you something some point that spoke to you and then we can wind up would you like to share sir anything that you found relevant Uh, yeah. This idea of uh, snowballing on the negative side and on the positive side, the idea that uh, the choices that we make uh, today have repercussions for the future, that they're not often as temporary as they feel, and that uh, we're in a sense choosing for eternity, or at least uh, preparing ourselves for the choices that are going to. come in the future with every little choice that we make now that's true beautifully good yeah almost for eternity it is mm. yeah we could say that so i mentioned about the positive also briefly actually if we do a particular thing repeatedly say if we decide i'm going to do meditation regularly so we start doing it start doing it gradually that will become a habit and we will we will feel as if something is missing in our life if we don't do it and so we need to sustain that moment like the snowball when it initially you might have to start pushing it down but once you start pushing it down it will gain momentum and then it will push itself down so similarly for us uh, we may have to push ourselves initially but what we push initially will push us eventually and that is the principle of inner empowerment or inner disempowerment also but it works both ways thank you anyone else I think I liked the metaphor of putting the words in the browser and the rest appears. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's such a good metaphor for how we form habits and what you said also about the every next similar choice is easier 
because we've made so many similar choices mm. before. And that can be in the negative side, but it, it can also be in the positive side. So I've noticed for myself, for example, that getting up very early has become very easy for me after I've done it for three or four years. Mm. It's not even a, an effort anymore. I just get up at the same time in the morning. But it used to be very, very hard to get up at five, uh, five o'clock in the morning, for example. So every time you do something, it becomes a little bit easier. That's true. Uh, basically, there is a part of us, our body and mind are like a programmed machine. So reprogramming requires effort. But at one level, a habit means that we don't have to consciously think about doing it. Now, of course, it's good to consciously think about everything that we do, but we have finite brain space. So if every, like it's, uh, if every time you want to send a message on your phone, then when you start sending it, open the message uh, app and they say, you know, what font do you want to use? What font size? What font color? What background uh, do you want to underline? If, you know, if you go into the preferences, there can be 50 parameters, isn't it? So now, if each time we had to enter those 50 parameters, we would get exhausted before we would get to the message also. So there are some things just we set as default. So same way, we, if we create a culture of good habits, then they become like the default which gets into place so that we can get on with the business of our life. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, I like what you just said about how we shouldn't put ourselves in the middle of temptation and expect our willpower to save us. Because I've, I've often felt that, like, oh, if I'm strong enough, I should be able to, you know, withstand whatever temptation. But how, like the way you said, it's just it's silly to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in a sense, uh, we can test our willpower, but you now we have to also consider what is the purpose. The purpose is not just to demonstrate that I have strong willpower. Right. The purpose is to do something constructive. Yeah, and not to again and again put yourself in situations that you know you have a weakness. Yeah, exactly. It's somehow our, in the, uh, our mind can trick us also into thinking that putting ourselves in tempting situations and then not getting tempted, that is a, that is a test of our inner strength. Well, that is one test, but that is not the only test. And that is a test which even if we succeed, okay, what, what is helped by that? The only thing that is boosted is our ego. And to the extent we become proud and I resisted that, next time when we succumb, we will feel mortified by that. We will feel disheartened by that. So it's far better to focus on something purposeful and use our willpower to do that purposeful thing. Thank you. Yeah. If I am not wrong, you are telling this, uh, every choice that we make is very important hmm. because that will lead to other choice. But recently, one day I realized I have a bad uh, habit of eating a lot. So um, at the time of uh, taking more into my plate, I realized that, okay, one more thing. Only this much, only this much. And later I realized that I will become lazy of the overeating. And after a few days, I realized that uh, uh, the act what I am doing, only a small portion only, I am extra taking extra. I am taking it very lightly that only small portion, but that is actually having a lot of impact on me after some time. So it looks like a small choice for me in the beginning, mm. but actually I am not seeing the impact of this choice on a uh, later time. And uh, that's what you are actually telling today is completely resonating with me, my dear. Yeah. See the very good example. The, the first way, uh, the dark side within us, the forces of illusion, they attack us, is by inducing nonchalance about the dark side. It doesn't matter. That is the first step. If we knew how serious something would be, we would not do it. What difference does it make? It doesn't matter. So it's, it, it is not inconsequential, but that's how it, is, it makes we, we think of it like that. And that's how we get in trouble. So to recognize that, uh, that this nonchalance is the first attack. It's just like if an enemy wants to attack, and the enemy, enemy first says, you know, oh, we are friends, why will we attack you? We're just happily here. And the enemy gets you to lower your guard. The enemy is coming forward and says, I'm just coming here to hug you. <laughs> and then they come and stab us. <laughs> So nonchalance towards indulgence 
is the first attack of indulgence. Nonchalance is, so if we see it that way, then we can be more guarded. Okay. Any one last point, anyone? But being on guard at every moment, is it possible? Or? Okay, good question. Is it possible to be on guard at every moment? Well, it's not so much to be on guard, it's to more to be focused at every moment. That means that if we are constantly thinking, I should not do this, I should not do this, I should not do this, that will drain us. Because negativity drains our energy. But if you are focused, that okay, this is what I am doing, and this is how I want to do this. And then that is productive. Okay, if you say, if I have to study, if I have to read, if I have to do some work, I focus on what I am doing. Hmm? And then as we start see, seeing the results of doing that, then we also feel energized by that. And then we can do more in that direction. But uh, if we are just simply staying on guard, I should not do this, I should not do this, that, that will drain us. So what we, should, what we need to have is always more of a focus. It is like as I said, give the example of the waves. Now, one wave comes and I am on the guard against the wave. Oh, the wave has come, I will fight against it. But what? After that, another wave is going to come. The mo more important thing is to hold to the anchor and by using the anchor to gradually get to the coast. Once I get to the coast, then I go beyond the waves. So there are times when the waves are coming and that time we need to be especially on guard. So we might always hold on to the anchor, but sometimes we might just loosen the anchor. And if that is the time when the wave hits us, we will be swept away. So our focus needs to be on holding on to the anchor. And while holding on to the anchor, we also need to be aware when the waves are coming. But uh, it is more, it is easier to be focused on something, on what we need to do, rather than to be guarded about what we should not do. So, that is why absorption in the positive is the best protection from the negative. It is not just being on guard against the negative. It is, you know, it is very, it is very unhelpful to make a resolution about what we will not do. If I make a resolution, say, I will never become angry again. Sometimes what happens, somebody makes a resolution, I will never become angry. And they start getting irritable. And then somebody tells them, you are getting angry. I am not getting angry. <laughs> they get angry even about being pointed out that you are angry. <laughs> so it is much better to make a more positive resolution. I did a seminar in, in, in Brisbane, in Australia, on burn anger before anger burns you. So the whole point is that rather than thinking from, I will not do this, that, you know, make a healthier resolution, make a more positive resolution. What is the positive resolution? He said, I will always respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. Now, if we all commit mistakes. Then when I commit a mistake, you know, I, would, I would prefer that the other person speak politely to me. So similarly, if I if you just think of the resolution this way, I will always speak politely or even I will respect everyone's right to be spoken to politely. Then what happens? Even if we go off, oh, that was impolite, I am sorry, I will speak more politely. But if I make a resolution, I will never become angry. For 30 days, I succeed. And 31st day I fail, I think I will fail. What is the use of my resolution? So if you make a positive resolution, even if we go off track, we can come back to the positive. But if our resolution is entirely centered on not doing the negative, then when we fail to stop it, we feel defeated by that completely. We feel all the previous 30 days of self-restraint was also a waste. That says it's always better to have positive resolutions. Okay. So, thank you very much for your attention and participation. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna, okay. I have one question. Okay. Do we have time? Yes. Okay. Uh, how to control our mind? Uh, the whole the whole talk was about that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I came here no. Maybe you can ask one of the students who. Oh, okay. mm, that, that's, that's why I won't okay. summarize the whole talk again. I'll okay. I'll explain that quickly. How can we control our mind? Basically, I talked about analyze, confront, and empower. That's the three things I talked about. The whole idea is that, first of all, we need to know inside that is something which needs to be controlled. 
we are often so caught in dealing with the outer challenges that we don't we are not even aware that there is a challenge inside me which i have to deal with hmm? then after that right. after that i have to confront if i don't control the mind what is the result going to be and then we need to empower see we can't empower we can't fight against say our desires our emotions our moods if we pit ourselves against that it will be very difficult rather what we do is we empower our healthy emotions to fight against our unhealthy emotions we empower our healthy desires to fight against our unhealthy desires so rather than thinking of i have to i have to fight against my mind you you use a follow formula of divide and rule divide and rule means find out that part of the mind that is good we all have some good desires we all have some good emotions we all have some good instincts so empower them and let them that means this desire is coming up oh i want to i want to watch i want to watch tv i want to watch this movie i want to do this that's an, maybe it's a time wasting desire but instead of saying i won't do this empower your healthy desire okay if i study if i work what will i be able to achieve in this much time visualize that and nourish that and when we empower the healthy desire and let that healthy desire fight against the unhealthy desire so if we keep fighting against the desire itself we will feel suppressed but if we make the battle less a healthy desire against an unhealthy desire then that's much more empowering okay thank you thank you so i think we have food for everyone outside yes thank you thank you very much for coming today hey krishna hey okay. krishna so do we have books prabhu can you ask man kishor prabhu okay no problem